The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. Jesus heals a man born blind, provoking a hostile reaction that he regards as spiritual blindness to the things of God. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must, not, or we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. 
Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would, have, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sins remain. This is the gospel of our Lord. I have a few uh, poems here. See if any of you all can guess the author. Oh, Captain, my Captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. Any guesses? Walt Whitman. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Here's another familiar one. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. You know, may know the rest. That's Robert Frost. The road not taken. Okay, this is a different one. Well, my daddy left home when I was three, and he didn't leave much to Ma and me, just this old guitar and a bottle of booze. Now, I don't blame him because he ran and hid, but the meanest thing that he ever did before he left, he went and named me Sue. It's not Johnny Cash, it's Shel Silverstein. Johnny stole it. Now he used it and made it famous. Yes, another poem. Okay. Roses are red, violets are blue. The dog is my favorite, but you're okay too. <laughs> well, this Lent, as we have been journeying and drawn to the cross with art, we've explored different ways that people witness their faith. In our Nave Lounge, we see paintings and drawings. There's sculptures, there's fabric art. Last Sunday, we had a narrative dramatic reading of an acting of sorts of our gospel. Each week, we, we participate or listen to the music and art in worship. And this week, we're going to explore the verbal art or poetry. So in your bulletin is an insert, and on one side is a picture and two poems. That is a digital artwork that's done on the theme of today's gospel reading. Now you may be one of those who enjoys those coloring books that are meant for meditation and relaxation. I don't have the patience for them, but you may take that or just enjoy the, the message that that artist is trying to convey with that, with that image. On the other side are two poems, and I've forgotten, I left mine up there. Okay, the first poem is about the day of Good Friday, and the second one, though, is written by a man who, at the age of 44, went blind. And so he shares a witness of his journey of life, um, with sight and then darkness. So I invite you to look through those and consider how God might be speaking to you through those. Now, when we think of scripture, we may not think of poetry, but some scholars estimate that over one-fourth of scripture is poetry. For example, hear this from Exodus 14. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters were turned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. Now hear the poetry of that in the very next chapter. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea. He picked officers were sunk in the Red Sea. 
His picked officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrew your adversaries. You sent out your fury, consumed them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The flood stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sink like lead in the mighty waters. The same story told in Exodus 14 and 15, both as narrative, but then as poetry. We see poetry throughout scripture, primarily though we may think of the Psalms as a place where poetry is uh, found. Now uh, there's uh, the familiar and very long Psalm of Psalm 119. And this is a Psalm that when read in Hebrew, we can see as an acrostic. An acrostic is where the first word or letter of each line has some significant meaning or spells something out. And in Psalm 119, there are 22 sections that all reflect the different letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So the first line starts with Aleph and then Beta and Gimel and and all of the Hebrew letters that are outlined in each of the 22 parts of that long psalm. So why have a psalm with an acrostic? Why have that? Some scholars say that it was just an artistic piece meant to add beauty and poetry to that that story. Some would say that it is meant to convey the whole topic of loving God's word, that it is everything from A to Z or from the first of their alphabet to the last. And some would say that the psalm is, is written in that way to be some sort of mnemonic device to help the people hear and learn and remember what it says. So we have this gift of art throughout God's word. And today we read one of the most beloved psalms, Psalm 23. And that's part of the poetry literature in scripture. Psalm 23, just like with any piece of art, each of us will hear it differently depending on where we are or what we've experienced. We'll hear it differently in each different parts of our, in each different part of our life. Well, on the other side of the insert that I gave to you all today are three different interpretations of Psalm 23. The first one is by a Japanese poet, and she wrote that psalm in the 60s. I believe, or the 70s. The middle version of Psalm 23 is by the man Eugene Peterson, and he wrote, interpreted scripture, translated it in modern day language, so it's very conversational. You may have read some of the message before. And then the third translation of Psalm 23 on that page is by the author Leslie Brandt, who I've talked about before. And each of these are unique. Each of these hold significant witness to that person's faith, where they are in their life, their history and background, their culture. And that's part of the gift of scripture, the gift of art in our faith. Well, today we heard another story from the Gospel of John. And one of the hallmarks of the Gospel of John is that when Jesus arrives on the scene and in our lives, everything changes. Limitations fall by the wayside with the one who can turn water to wine. There's no need for sacrifice because, like John said, behold the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. There's no need for anything else. 
Divisions between Samaritans and Jews fade away in the presence of the one who provides living water and the one who can heal even a man born blind is the one who offers not just life, but abundant life. So when Jesus comes into our lives, things change. And this sounds good. Until we realize that change is always disruptive. And then we wonder whether the change, even if it promises new life, is worth it. Because what is known even if it is upsetting, is often preferred to what is unknown. Even if that unknown promises goodness and mercy and a cup that overflows. Last week, we witnessed Jesus seek out a woman, and he offered that woman living water, a cup that would overflow. And this week, we witnessed Jesus seek out a man and a community in need of different kinds of guidance. The man received it with joy. The community did not. The man knelt down with an open heart and confessed, I believe. It was not just his sight, but his heart that was opened. His spirit was willing to receive new life and be changed, and he believed. So how have you been called to see something new this Lent? Be it in some of the different types of art that we've explored, or devotionals or conversations, how has your heart been shaped or changed or created anew? We've heard the Gospels the last two weeks from the font. Because at the font, everything changes. Water is not just water, but it is living and sustaining and eternal. We hear God's word at the font because when we are receptive, when we are open and humble of heart, our old preconceived notions, our old attitudes, our past limitations, our previous barriers, they are all washed away. So may we all, like the man who regained his sight, be like clay in the potter's hand, ready to be shaped into a new creation. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you in this journey of Lent reflective and receptive. Guide us in our journey. Help our hearts to be made new in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Together let us sing hymn number 779.